Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. Judith Bowman, MD, a specialist in biochemical imbalances, received a BA from Illinois Wesleyan University and a medical degree from Finch University of Health Sciences Chicago Medical School. She received her certification and license by the American Registry of Radiologic Technology and Board Certification in Nuclear Medicine Technology following the completion of her training at Northwestern University's School of Nuclear Medicine. She utilized her skills in diagnostic imaging and participated in research and development of radio pharmaceuticals. Dr. Bowman completed her residency in family medicine at Resurrection Hospital in Chicago, where she also served as chief resident. After medical school, Dr. Bowman worked as a staff physician for the Lake County Health Department in Illinois and as the Midwest site staff physician providing medical services for patients with learning disabilities at the Door Achievement Center in Schaumburg, Illinois. Her interest and experience with behavioral learning issues and autism steadily increased when she joined the medical team at Pfeiffer Treatment Center in 2005. During her tenure at Pfeiffer, Dr. Bowman became known for her consistent presence and care at each and every U.S. outreach clinic. Dr. Bowman co-founded Mensa Medical in 2008 with her colleague Albert Mensa, MD. Dr. Bowman combines traditional medicine with the biochemical approach to the treatment of symptoms of behavioral and cognitive disorders, autism spectrum disorder, depression, including postpartum depression, anxiety, eating disorders, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and other biochemical imbalances. Welcome. Thanks for joining us here today. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in this field? You know, it's kind of a long story, but um, I was working at the Lake County Health Department in um, Lake County, Illinois, and a, a large number of my practice were, uh, well, the plethora of, of the population, but there tended to be a lot of children and a lot of women. So I primarily focused on uh, pediatrics for the most part and a great deal also of women's health. So one morning, though, I had a three-year-old come into the office that was on a lot of psychotropic medications, which made no sense to me at all. This was the only way someone thought that they could control this poor child who was obviously having a lot of difficulties with attention, focus, um, mood, uh, tantrums. And something in me just says, this is just not the way to approach this. There must be a better way. And so the thought was to look for some more of a, a natural approach in handling um, these kinds of things. And so one a bit of research led to another, and I eventually uh, found the uh, Pfeiffer Treatment Center that would actually was doing things from an orthomolecular approach, and at the time they were actually looking for physicians to train. And so um, I quickly got on board with that and did some more inquiring about it. Still held my position at the Lake County Health Department, but eventually trained with uh, William Walsh, and I found out that there's another way to approach these issues that did not include really hardcore medications, particularly in pediatrics. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. how, how long ago was that? Oh, heavens. I think maybe we're working on it about 15 years ago at this point. Yeah. Wow. And so now that you're using the orthomolecular, are you finding a, a specialty focus in, in women's health or in children? What, what's, what is it that you are targeting? I'm sure that also came to um, my attention that a lot of women that I was seeing could not really connect the dots between their hormonal concerns and really um, their uh, micronutrients as, as playing a part, a part of their problems. Um, many women that we had, I had actually started on things like hormonal replacement, 
or birth control pills. Uh, well, they come in for those things for reasons that are obvious, but a lot of them were starting to have anxiety and depression and could not figure out the connection between, like I said, their biochemistry and their, their hormonal uh, issues. And so now that years have gone by, and once again, having trained at the Pfeiffer Treatment Center, I learned that there were a great number of imbalances in a certain segment of the population, of the women population, I should say, um, that were just simply estrogen dominant, and that as the years go by, there was an accumulation of things that happened to them. Um, and so when they presented with things like anxiety or depression or postpartum depression, I was really seeking to understand why these things were occurring. And um, after having been trained, you know, at the, um, the fiber treatment center, it became really quite clear as to what was going on. It turned out to be this estrogen dominance and um, copper toxicity. And those are probably the two main items that uh, were causing problems in many different directions, kind of like the snowball rolling down the hill. And I can get into that if you'd like to hear me uh, yeah, what, so, that. So, so what happens when there's estrogen dominance and copper toxicity? Okay, this is how it goes. And generally, this is what I'm telling a patient as they come in with some of their issues. So what you have is a situation where the young lady will present and she'll say, you know, I'm having a lot of um, anxiety. I'm having heavy menstrual cycles. I'm also having some difficulties with uh, the formation of fibroid tumors or I'm having endometriosis, these are all things that are related to estrogen, estrogen dominance in females. And um, so what I would do, so what we need to do actually is probably test your chemistry because what we're finding is that when you have estrogen dominance, there's a natural physiologic response for copper, the metal copper, to come into your system as if there's a large release of it that just comes in. When that happens, you're actually change, changing your electrolyte balance in many ways. Copper comes into your system, okay? What does that do? By itself, copper by itself with nothing else wrong will cause anxiety, can cause depression, can cause foggy brain and difficulties with you uh, making uh, or processing information is what I should say. Now, why does that seem like that's unusual? Well, it really is not. When you're thinking about your brain, which is a, um, oh, I guess you can call it a, it's a chemical uh, neurologic net network, and it's an electrolyte network. And where do we use electricity? We actually uh, use electricity in anything that needs it, like a light bulb or anything else, because it's a great conductor of electricity. So when you think about the brain being an electrical organ, and you're having too much of an influx of copper in a brain that's already an electrical organ, you can simply, quote unquote, um, I guess you could say uh, short circuit processes. When you do that, you're short circuiting the ability to process information. So whether you're trying to figure out a math question or you're having an emotional response, if you deviate those pathways, they don't end up where they were intended to go. And so then for many females, you have some confusion. You might have some anxiety. You might have emotions that are really kind of blown out of, uh, blown up in actuality where there shouldn't be as much of a reaction. You can get much more of a reaction. And all your five senses can be heightened in such a way that it causes you a level of dysfunction. So that's part of it. That's one thing that copper will do. The other thing that it will do though, it tends to suppress zinc levels and this is where the snowball slowly starts to roll down the hill and many problems can be created so as that happens copper and zinc have a wonderful relationship that's usually one-to-one -one in a normal scenario but when one of them rises it suppresses the other so as copper rises it suppresses zinc levels zinc is important for the production of neurotransmitters, among many other things that it does. When you actually are suppressing neurotransmitters, what are you doing? Well, first of all, your neurotransmitters, whether it's serotonin or dopamine or norepinephrine, they all require zinc for that production. But if you are suppressing it with copper levels, obviously you're not gonna have the benefit 
of uh, producing your serotonin. So what happens to your overall sense of well-being? That slowly goes away. And sometimes it's an insidious process, but it does happen. And so the young female, or actually females of any age, might present with a depressed sort of feeling or a sadness that comes along. If it's severe enough, very often you, you find yourself in your primary care doctor's office or a um, uh, psychiatrist's office with a diagnosis of depression. And so what happens then naturally is you may or may not start on an antidepressant. When in fact, if we could just simply balance your chemistry and get your zinc levels up what they need to be, you might start making your own neurotransmitters in amounts that are going to be beneficial to you. But that's not all that copper does. So let me just kind of recap a little first two things we talked about. It can provoke a lot of brain system confusion by itself because it's deviating pathways and short-circuiting pathways in the brain. The other thing that it's doing is it's causing you to produce low levels of the neurotransmitters that would be most beneficial to you in certain circumstances, particularly emotional circumstances. Now, a third thing that uh, copper will do, it actually will um, cause your mitochondria, I don't know if you remember back in high school or when they talked about your mitochondria being the powerhouse of the right. cell. Right, the it energy producing us, part yeah, of the cell. Exactly, well, it stops that process, and about, about that process in about three different places. And so, in addition to feeling depressed, in addition to feeling an inability to process information, you're also, might, you also might be feeling things like fatigue, adrenal fatigue, just fatigue in general, mental fatigue. And so by the time you put all these symptoms together, these are many other presentations of females that come into the office. Now, one, one way that it does that, ATP, people recognize energy production as, oh, ATP. Well, traditionally, we're taught in medical school that 36 ATP is what you should make. And that will give any cell that is in the energy that's required. However, if you're making less than that, your ability to have any kind of stamina, or if you want to call it state with itness, um, it's just not going to be there for you. So that's the other thing that it does. Um, what I haven't mentioned is that one of your neurotransmitters, dopamine, which is your euphoric, all is well with the world, I won the lottery, I feel great. Um, that particular neurotransmitter in the presence of copper cannot stay uh, dopamine very long. It is, and, and this is in everybody's uh, biochemistry book in medical school, dopamine in the presence of copper gets converted to norepinephrine, which is actually equal to noradrenaline, one and the same. And the noradrenaline gets converted into adrenaline. And so then if you are a high copper female with whatever amount of dopamine, dopamine that you have around, uh, if copper gets together with dopamine, you suddenly are getting the conversion into adrenaline. And so now she's feeling anxious. Now she has uh, fright and flight. And um, that's another thing that we also often hear though when females come into the office is they have a great deal of anxiety. I have a great deal of fright or flight. They don't know where it's coming from. I have panic that comes out of nowhere Life should be good, but I am not feeling it. So if we go back again and kind of talk about what copper does to you, um, certainly anxiety and panic, uh, certainly fatigue, neurotransmitters that are going to be dysregulated, your overall sense of well-being that's simply not there. So those are things in and of itself that are enough to really have anybody come into the office and seek some help. Okay. One of the last things for sure that I need to mention is that what's not known, particularly to the lay public, is that many of um, many a female who has postpartum depression or even postpartum psychosis often have copper levels that are simply through the roof. Give you an example. If, let's say, the this medical cutoff for copper levels is 110, very often um, the women that come in with major depression or postpartum psychosis will have copper levels that are in the high 200s or the high 300s. And when you have that, 
you have short circuiting of the brain that is without question going to be extremely problematic. These are the women that you hear about in terms of the horrible stories of walking off of a building or driving the car into the lake or driving the car into the White House or killing the children or killing the husband. They simply cannot process information well and whatever it is that's going on in their heads, they truly believe that. Um, so unless there's something that can be done about that, um, they tend not to fare very well. So what is the source of the copper? Copper is just ubiquitous. It's always around. It's in the foods that we eat. Um, it's, it's really in quite many things, but mostly from our food sources, perhaps our water sources. Uh, it's always around. It's in, believe it or not, uh, high copper foods, and these are actually some of the most nutritious things that we can have. It just means that we shouldn't have them in large numbers. We are those people who cannot process copper um, very well. And I need to talk about that because this is not every single female on the planet. But things like, um, oh, high copper foods, for instance, uh, avocados, a wonderful, wonderful fruit vegetable, vegetable, if you want to call it that, but it's very, very high in copper. Things that we love like cashews. One of the number one lovely things on the planet is chocolate, but chocolate is also extremely high in copper. Um, just those three things are enough that if you eat them on a regular basis, and some people do um, on a regular basis, you may run into a little difficulty if your body is not able to metabolize or at least get rid of copper in what we call a timely manner. Almonds, another thing, and I, I love those myself, once again, these are commonly eaten foods that if you happen to be particularly the female who doesn't metabolize copper well, you get what I call a slow accumulation. And that can be over time. That can be over years. And um, very often this is what happens when, um, and I really need to kind of preempt it by saying that um, not every female on the planet will have this difficulty. But there is a segment of the population, I'd say maybe 50, 60 percent, tend to be on the estrogen dominant side. And those are going to be the females that, for whatever reason, can't get rid of copper in what I call a timely manner. That's usually noted after their first menstrual cycle. They'll have their first menstrual cycle. Copper comes in. Copper is important for the development of blood vessels. And that's its natural physiologic response. Every month she's gonna have a cycle. Every month she's gonna develop little blood vessels. If there's no fertilization of the egg that came down, then you slough that off and that becomes the menstrual cycle. That happens every single month on a regular basis. Over years though, the copper levels keep rising to a new set point. Almost like if there's a, uh, a hole in the bucket theory, but the hole is so small in the bucket until you can still overfill it. And so for reasons like that, you get this slow accumulation over time of copper levels. And so many females think that all of a sudden they have depression. All of a sudden they have some um, sensory processing issues and other things that arise from high copper when in fact over time this has been happening to them. So, um, well, that's kind of how it works. And so what is it that's needed to get, start either getting rid of the copper or balance it out? You mentioned zinc. Is that all you right. do is you increase other minerals to balance out the copper or is there a detoxification process for the copper? I would say that we do a little bit of all of the above. Certainly, when I mentioned the relationship between zinc and copper, zinc is definitely, if you want to call it one of the tools that we use to try to balance the copper-zinc balance, which really should be one-to-one. -one. So zinc is, is used. There's also something called molybdenum. Interestingly enough, we're finding that many women who are not able to absorb molybdenum, which is another metal, we just get out of the ground, it's oh, the food that you grow, um, if they can't absorb that and they have some sort of malabsorption issue, um, that's going to be a problem because it's one of the natural elements that sequesters copper and keeps it in check. Bottom line is um, copper can be free radical copper, which means that it's just kind of a, 
by itself, a charged particle just running around. Uh, in actuality, uh, that should not happen. Generally, when it comes into the body, it's supposed to be tagged to its protein. So it has what you call a carrier protein that keeps it out of trouble. Now, I'm going to use a, a little story that I'm sure Dr. Mensa doesn't always like for me to say, but I think it'll paint the mental picture of why copper needs to be tagged to its carrier protein. Um, I use the example of the little yellow school bus. Everybody kind of knows what that is. Um, the school bus itself, if you let that represent the carrier protein called ceruloplasmin, not an easy, easy word to say, but it's ceruloplasmin. Let that be the carrier protein. And let little children who are supposed to get on the bus represent free radical copper, copper that you get from the foods that you eat that's coming into your system. The idea is for there to be enough school buses, let's say, to get all the children on the bus. The purpose is to take them where they're supposed to go to school, drop them off, they go into the school, when they come out of the school, they get back on the bus and they go back to their respective homes. If you don't make enough school buses, there's not enough school buses for all the children to get on those that cannot get on are going to be problematic. They're going to get into trouble. They're gonna go kicking cans and fighting each other and acting like little gang members. And I think you kind of get the picture. And a lot of times, many women don't produce enough ceruloplasmin to have, say, copper be tagged to its protein. And this is where um, the dangerous part of free copper uh, comes into play because it is a charged particle. And you can't have charged particles just running around willy-nilly. They get into trouble. They attack enzymes, hormones, proteins, neurotransmitters. They upset the electrical balance in the brain because they are indeed charged particles. And so um, I just thought I'd mention that piece as well. Well, and I have uh, uh, worked with a number of women over the years who had the emotional issues you're talking about. And, and occasionally I run into somebody who's also got uh, chronic migraines. Is that something that's related to the same estrogen mm -hmm. dominance and, and copper you're talking about? Yes, that's exactly who I'm talking about. So the women, once again, the category that I'm talking about, uh, uh, they present very often with heavy menstrual cycles, okay? Um, they'll present with endometriosis at times. Many of them go, to develop, go on to develop things like fibroid tumors. A lot of women end up with uh, hysterectomies because of heavy menstrual cycles, often known as menorrhagia. Um, it's, uh, it's a problem that if you don't know about that, it, it's difficult to connect the between problems and mood and demeanor issues. And as much as I hate to admit it, uh, very often, uh, and most women don't like to hear it, when someone says, you know, uh, are you on your menstrual cycle? Is there something going on? Because there tends to be this thing that happens about once a month, or gee, you don't seem to be doing pretty well, but only maybe two weeks out of the month, what is the problem? And this is usually the problem. that has to do with a lot of brain chemistry, uh, disarray, neurotransmitters that are kind of out of balance that makes her really, and I don't like to give people excuses, but this is one where there is an excuse why she feels more irritable, why she feels more agitated, you know, along with the physical discomforts that come along with it. And um, we find out when we test those women, they indeed have, they indeed have I should say, uh, chemical imbalances that are responsible for that. And it's in the range of high copper or copper toxicity. Well, um, so are there treatments or food sensitivities or things that the lay person can do to assist this, or is it necessary to have specific treatment from someone like you who's a specialist? Uh, a lay person can also uh, help themselves just having the information and knowing that this could be part of the problem. Um, we can... You can spread out over the course of a week or so the amount of high copper foods that exist. Certainly if you Google foods highest in copper and um, not eliminate, but rather spread them out, 
it won't be as a, a quick as a, of, of an accumulation, put it like that, of copper. You can also, and this is not every woman, I, I have to say again, it's not every woman on the planet that doesn't have, that's, that that happens to, but it's a matter of, for us, it's testing to find out if you're in that category so that we can further advise you in terms of what to do. Um, certainly, if we know what your chemistry is, we can advise on um, what nutrients might be very helpful to you, things like using molybdenum, things like taking zinc, because perhaps you're actually zinc deficient, and that's playing into the imbalance. And there are other things as well. There's a substance called a metallothionine, which everybody makes that particular protein, by the way. Um, that first part, metal or metallothionine, is actually the protein that helps one to balance the minerals and metals that should be there. But if it's not working well, or yours is uh, just not as uh, potent as it should be, you may have problems even with uh, copper toxicity or other metal toxicity for that matter. Um, Metallothionine, to kind of paint another movie of how this particular protein works, um, it looks like a giant, well, I'm just going to say that it does, but this is how it works metaphorically. It's like a giant golf ball where every little dent on that golf ball is specifically for a mineral or metal that should be present in any cell at any time. And so what this giant protein does is it walks into a cell and says, oh, look, uh, there's only supposed to be 110 copper there. Why is there 140? Well, I need to take 30 of those out, and then I'm going to roll myself into position and look at zinc next. Well, zinc, there should be at least 90 there. Uh, why is there only 65? And then it goes into its little zinc pocket and appropriates the amount of zinc that should be there. In other words, it'll go down a list of hundreds and hundreds of minerals and metals that should be there in a particular proportion and then regulate that. So that particular cell has got every mineral or metal that should be there in the right proportion. And then it moves on to the next cell. If your metallothionine doesn't work well, then you won't have that ability. And so you're gonna have some electrolyte disturbances, some mineral disturbances. And so that's another thing. Uh, metallothionine um, in the right form with the right potency is gonna play into this as well. So is that a supplement that can be taken, the metal thionine? It is. Um, it's called metallothionine. And what we do is we, we call it a metallothionine promotion therapy, which means that we can give you a series of uh, amino acids and zinc and some other formulations that go into it that actually provoke your own metallothionine to get moving get going, do what you need to do, regulate these cells. And it does so, interestingly enough, it does so in both the gut and the brain, which is kind of why, where you have this gut-brain connection thing that kind of comes with this all. But if it can regulate and um, get some integrity going with the membranes of, in, the, in the gut as well as the brain, then you can have a pretty good functioning uh, GI tract as well as the brain. Well, we hear a lot about gut health. So that's another days. thing that we, yes. Are you there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we hear a lot about gut yeah, still here. health these days. And the, the idea, mm -hmm. as I understand it, as a non-scientist in that realm, is that if the chemistry in the, in the digestive process isn't balanced properly, then I can't use the nutrients in the food I'm eating. Mm -hmm. um, what part of the work that you do with the orthomolecular work is looking at the gut health? That is an issue. It's probably one of the larger issues we have, particularly um, in the pediatric community. Um, there is definitely a gut-brain connection. Um, the problem is if you are malabsorptive, how can you have the building blocks that are needed to do the jobs and to make things that your body needs. How can it make its enzymes, hormones, proteins, and neurotransmitters if indeed you can't get the building blocks on board? You know, in our basic design, we're designed to eat. Food is our medicine. We need to be able to get that in. But if you cannot absorb it, you need to find out why is that 
you know, um, an extreme case is we know that some people have celiac disease. They're going to have some difficulties when they're trying to eat things that contain gluten. In fact, they're going to have some disasters if they do. Um, when you take in items, though, that seem to be inflammatory to your GI tract, it produces a malabsorptive state. Um, very often, it'll produce also inflammation. And inflammation, uh, in and of itself, is going to uh, decrease your ability to absorb many of the things that you need. If that happens over a long period of time, you can get into what's called a nutritional deficit. If that's a problem, and your body is all about um, maintaining a good physical status, and so great physiology, uh, good physical structure, uh, that is actually going to be a priority. Believe it or not, your brain kind of gets the leftovers after your body takes what it needs. It's all about survival first. But when, when you find out that there's not enough nutrients on board and that your brain's just going to kind of get some of the leftovers, it's not going to function probably at its maximal capacity itself. And so I'm going to bring it back again to this uh, metallothionine scenario here. Uh, metallothionine, there's actually four types, types one, two, three, and four. What's extremely important, particularly in growth and development, is that there should be enough metallothionine both in the gut and in the brain, and that's metallothionine two, so that the integrity of the cells in the gut and the brain both function at maximum capacity. And then you get the best of both worlds. You get great nutrition, great absorbency, and the ability to get what you need in order to make enzymes, hormones, proteins, and neurotransmitters in amounts that are gonna be beneficial. So it's kind of a comprehensive viewpoint and how to live and live well if you can get these balances going. So what's another major set of issues whether it's in the general population or in women's health, that you find responds well to the orthomolecular work that you do? I would say um, overall health is what we really try to do is provide what's needed from every aspect, both mentally and physically. Um, so it's more of a comprehensive uh, scenario. A patient comes in, they have their set of complaints that they find to be the most dominant in their life that they would like to have a solution. They would like to have this resolved. They want this fixed. Um, they, they also have some other things that are going on with them that they may or may not recognize. What we find after testing and finding out where their biochemical imbalances are, that many of the other issues that they may have had also tend to get much better. I mean, granted, no one's perfect and no one lives forever, what we're trying to do is maximize their personal blueprint, maximize what their DNA was supposed to be at its best. And for that to happen, um, both physically, physiologically, mentally, growth and development, everything needs to be balanced. And so that's actually what it is that we do, but we target in on those special areas of concern. And there tends to be, um, a great deal of biochemical imbalance when when we do discover that's where their problem is. Mm -hmm. So with the issues of the mental emotional health tying into the physical, yes, the gut health and the brain function, do you work in conjunction with other professionals? Do you refer or are you exclusively just looking at the nutritional side? I think it's a wonderful thing for you to ask because this is not a one-way street. It does take more than one modality. It's kind of like running a race. There's so many different things that you need to do. You need to eat right. You need to practice. You need to, in many cases for athletes, you need to supplement. There's also counseling that needs to take place. And whether that comes in the form of um, uh, a religious adventure or a psychological counseling or any kind of counseling that counseling that you get, um, there needs to be multiple modalities that have happened for this whole thing to work out the way that it should. Um, like I said, when you're running a race, there's so many different things that you need to do. To do only one of them only gives you strength in one area. So we do refer, 
to psychologists. We do refer to psychiatrists. Many times our patients will come to us already having those modalities in place, which is great because we absolutely encourage them to stay with that. Um, but at some point in time also, um, you have to get out and try to do those things which you've been kind of shy on doing because you felt you didn't have the capacity to do it or the mental stability to do it. And we have patients that are going back to school, going back to work, um, and completing whatever their goals were, you know, once their biochemistry is balanced and once that correlates with uh, the symptoms that they were having in terms of improvement. Well, I was just, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was just about to ask, do you have um, a, a couple success stories that you could share with our audience? We have probably many, many, many success stories. Um, I do recall a young man that came into the office with, um, uh, we very often will see patients that have bipolar disorder. And very often their bipolar disorder is secondary to uh, uh, an imbalance in their chemistry. Um, there's something called chiral disorder where zinc and B6 seem to be very low supply. When that happens, there tends to be rapid cycling of mood uh, and demeanor, uh, anger or flightiness, or, or um, people go on excursions and do things that just seem very flighty and, and inappropriate. Once you can stabilize that mood, though, they become very organized individuals. This particular young man was um, trying to um, get involved with the family business but was basically kind of paralyzed by his own feelings to be able to participate. And several, um, several months later, uh, was running the family business and has done so for years, you know, up to date, up to this very time period, simply because their chemistry is now balanced. We've also had young, young people go away to college. This is really kind of a typical story. I've seen them go off to college, and many of them, when you get to college, what do you have? You have a nutritional deficit because you were probably not eating quite right. The, the staple in college tends to be ramen noodles, maybe spaghetti, pizza, uh, a lot of uh, high starchy sort of scenarios. And your, your vegetables are kind of pushed off to the side. Maybe there's other things that you're doing as well. But there tends to be more of a nutritional deficit. For some people, they can't afford that. And so very often, if something happens like this, so-called mental breakdown, it's, it's because our neurotransmitters are dysregulated, it's because they're trying to balance for the first time their schoolwork, their social life, and um, those activities of daily living. They're managing themselves for their first time, one foot out of the door, so to speak. And very often, many of these kids will have so-called a break. Um, when we um, get a chance to evaluate them, they have tremendous nutritional deficit and biochemical imbalances that are really quite um, oh, dominant that's actually causing the problem. Once they are balanced, so to speak, they are able to really achieve their goals. We've watched them freshman year all the way through graduate school really thrive very, very well in terms of their overall functionality. Uh, we've also seen a lot of our kids in the autism spectrum disorder which I really consider probably one of the most challenging things that we do. These kids come in and everything you can possibly test, everything that you can uh, evaluate is off the charts in terms of abnormalities. Their guts are in terrible conditions. You know, of course, from a mental st um, challenge standpoint, we've probably seen children with autism. They have a great deal of challenge relative to making um, any sense of the world. We have had children, what I call as flipping that child into mainstream, meaning that they came in with the autism spectrum disorder uh, diagnosis, but um, some of them, you cannot really tell that that ever happened just because they have um, graduated into what's called mainstream. They may have a few quirks here and there, so to speak, but uh, many of them have um, are leading regular lives. Bottom line with that though, if you don't get these kids in early, meaning, oh, two, three, four, five, maybe up to about seven years old, the chances of mainstream um, become a little less realistic, put it like that. The brain is indeed a, um, a plastic organ up to a point. There's a lot of plasticity. There's some things that you can turn around, 
There are things that you can fix. The things that can set a kid on a course of um, mainstream sort of scenarios, but if you don't get to them early enough, you know, that tends to slide away if, if you can't have early intervention, put it like that. So mm -hmm. the, the, the summary that I'm getting is uh, specifically related to these college kids you're talking about. I had the pleasure of mm -hmm. uh, in, interviewing Catherine Adams, who does a lot of work with early identification of yeah. psychotic episodes. And, mm -hmm. you know, she had a statistic that's kind of mind boggling about how many, what percentage of young people between whether it's 15 and 30, somewhere in that range, are mm -hmm. going to have a psychotic episode or some kind of a dysregulation of their central nervous system that gets diagnosed as a psychotic episode. So what right. they're processing in terms of information gets scrambled. The, the way the world looked to them all of a sudden doesn't look that way anymore they get disoriented and what i'm hearing you say is that that responds well to the kind of analysis you do in the orthomolecular targeted nutrient therapy work it does and let's let's bring in another factor that we haven't talked about um many of these things are predictable in terms of the timeline. When you mention somewhere between 15 and 30 years old, very often you can see that. Um, these are things that are somewhat insidious. They are happening a little bit at a time until they get to a point of break. Um, and there is a genetic predisposition, meaning that things tend to run in families. It doesn't mean they have to manifest, but they can. And there's also what you call epigenetics, which is simply the buzzword these days for the environment imposed upon your DNA. Okay, and everybody has a little bit of a different set point in terms of when things become so stressful that they might have a break. And between the ages of about 15 and 30 seems pretty much right on target in terms of when some of these things happen. Um, um, when you think about the kid going off to college and all the stressors that are imposed upon them, you know, when they were in their home environment, things seem to be quite fine. Everything's good, we're all in balance, life is good. Stepping a foot out the door, though, and having to deal with life, life's issues of daily living, classes, and socializing, whatever else is going on, can be a tremendous stress upon that particular person. It's an imposition. It's the environment imposed upon a DNA where it's weakening and weakening to the point of perhaps a break. And sometimes when that happens, um, it's... It's like a train that's just running wild. You have to stop it at some point. And very often you can do that and revert back to what normalcy was um, if you can at least get that person in balance biochemically. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's a the tie-in to what I was saying before was that when you're talking about if you can get to these people with the autism type issues at yes. three or four or five or maybe seven, they can yeah. get in the mainstream. The research that uh, Catherine Adams is working with, and they're, they're doing a lot globally with this work, but here in the, mm -hmm. the U.S. as well, says, without a doubt, the earlier you get an intervention and help these people stabilize and have supports, the better the outcome, the better the, the return to normal. And mm -hmm. for some of them, you know, some studies were saying 72 weeks and then uh, some were saying hey look it's really more like 12 weeks if you can get mm. to somebody within the first couple of months of mm -hmm. them having a disruption like that and right. i would imagine it would be um right in line with what you're talking about the sooner you balance the body and brain chemistry the better the less damage is done i would agree most definitely would agree um a lot of people hold back uh, because I guess stigma that comes along with it, but that's not the time to hold back at all. It's called jumping on this right away. Um, that's the best way to have a, a success. You know, the longer you wait, the more problematic that that's likely to be. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Well, as we're winding down here, is there some area of, of the work you do or the people that you like to reach that we haven't even touched on yet? No, it's just anybody who has an issue and they suspect that it could be anything from a mood disorder, uh, autism, like ADD, ADHD, attention focus problems, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, postpartum depression, um, uh, 
postpartum psychosis for that matter, you know, or just women, estrogen, dominance, hormonal issues, all of those things we, we deal with. And it all starts pretty much the same way in terms of how we have our approach is really to test the chemistry and then resolve the issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you probably see a lot of people who've exhausted what the traditional psychiatric and medical profession can do for them. And if they're already on two or three medications, the example you were using in the beginning of the talk, there was a three-year-old mm -hmm. on several right. medications. I'm hearing you say that people shouldn't use that as an excuse not to come and get evaluated, that you can work with them even if they're on a whole bunch of meds. You're actually very correct. Half of our patients, I would say, come to us already on medication. And by all means, it does not mean, oh, stop your medication. No, let's try to build two bridges for you. You have one that's giving you some level of stability. I definitely prefer that um, children not be on medication, but medication has helped many a child to gain at least a bit of stability, particularly when it comes to attention and focus issues and ADHD medications. But in terms of any medication that's out there, if you're on medication, that is fine. It doesn't collide with what we do. It means that we're gonna to try to build you another bridge and try to provoke your own system to do what it needs to do in terms of enzymes, hormones, proteins, and neurotransmitters, and only at that time. And we're usually looking about a year, year and a half out, will we say, well, maybe this is time to see whether or not you can even wean down to either what might be the lowest effective dose, or maybe you can wean off of medications and do very, very well. And so it's not like we're poo pooing medication, because it has allowed a lot of stability for a lot of folks. It works a lot faster than nutrient therapy. Nutrient therapy takes a while, and we look at it oh, in a stair-step kind of way, maybe three months, you're better, six months, you're even better, nine months, you're better, and so on. But it tends to be stair-stepping your way up into biochemical balance. That's going to take some time. And so without changing too many variables, meaning, oh, you know, you should just uh, get rid of your medication. No, that is not at all what we would advise, because that's the one thing that's giving you a little bit of health there. It's got side effects. We're going to try to help protect you against those side effects while you're on that medication. But we're also going to try to build that other bridge of functionality before we think about changing that medication profile or perhaps even getting off. Wonderful. Wonderful. I greatly appreciate your taking the time to talk with us today. And um, the, the primary way that I know to reach you is mensamedical.com. Is there another way? Do you have other avenues that you want to leave in the podcast for people to reach out to you? It's a great way to start it. Our phone number, though, anyone can call our office at area code 630-256-8308. Um, our clinical coordinators will help to uh, guide you on how to be a patient, if that's your desire. Um, that is the best way to get in touch with us, though, for a quick uh, introduction to us. You can also, as you have uh, alluded to, look at our website at mensamedical.com. Of course, Mensa is spelled with an H on the end of it, M-E-N-S-A-H, medical.com. You can look at our websites. You can look at our videos that are there. There are many of them, all the subject areas that I mentioned. Uh, Dr. Mensa does most of them. I am doing one on women's health and estrogen and copper issues. And so feel free to look at that one. <laughs> All right. Well, I greatly appreciate your taking the time and I look forward to uh, following how things develop. I know that uh, when I was talking to Dr. Mensa, he was talking about getting some research going. And, oh, yes. um, and, and it's been a great pleasure to meet you again and to have the interview. And I look forward to our next conversation. Oh, you are so welcome. And thank you for allowing the opportunity. I really appreciate that. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.